Like many nations before it, Yugoslavia proved to be no match in a head-to-head -head fight against the Axis powers and was quickly invaded and occupied. But even with their military and government in shambles, the Yugoslav people refused to surrender and soon a spirited resistance movement emerged. United by the desire for a free Yugoslavia, thousands of determined fighters began to wage a protracted war against their fascist occupiers using every means available. Today we're going to explore how this heroic fight morphed into more than just a painful thorn in Germany's side and how the Yugoslav resistance ultimately became became one of the most organized and successful resistance movements of the Second World War. As Europe was enveloped in the violence of the Second World War, Yugoslavia was in an interesting period as a nation. Within the borders of Yugoslavia were at least 10 major ethnicities and several languages, which had led to a lot of infighting and overall instability. By 1940, the nation was under the rule of Prince Paul, acting as regent until his cousin's son, Peter II, was of age to take the throne. Prince Paul not only had to deal with the constant bickering within Yugoslavia, but also with the growing threat that the Axis powers posed to the Balkans. Most of Western Europe had already fallen, and it was only a matter of time until the Fuhrer's gaze settled on Yugoslavia. And sure enough, Prince Paul was soon faced with a choice. Kneel before the Axis and give in to their demands, or risk the consequences. Paul chose what seemed to be the easiest option, and in March 1941, Yugoslavia officially signed the Tripartite Pact, handing over its territory, resources, and men to the Axis powers. While this decision had somewhat decent support in Slovenia and Croatia, the majority of the Yugoslav military was Serbian, and suffice to say, they were not very happy with the decision. Just two days after the pact was signed, Prince Paul was overthrown in a military coup d'etat, which placed the 17-year-old Peter II in charge, declaring him to be of sufficient age to rule. The new government then desperately began talks with the Allies, hoping to secure some support, but their fate had already been sealed. Hitler was so infuriated with the turn of events that he postponed the invasion of the Soviet Union to instead attack Yugoslavia, and he wasted no time preparing. On April 6, 1941, the skies over the Balkans were filled with Luftwaffe bombers which laid waste to airfields, military installations, and Yugoslavia's capital, Belgrade. This was followed by a ground invasion from nearly every side by Germany, Italy, and Hungary in an overwhelming assault that secured a total Axis victory in a little over a week. Peter II fled the country, forming a Yugoslav government in exile. Once the country had accepted an unconditional surrender, it was chopped up and shared between its invaders. Italy took Dalmatia, Croatia became an Axis puppet state, and Serbia became a German-occupied zone. Yugoslavia had been completely dismantled as a nation, but the surviving members of the army were already preparing to fight back. The remaining Yugoslav soldiers found refuge in the mountainous terrain of Bosnia and Serbia, which provided them with a brief safe haven to recover and plan their next move while the Axis occupied the cities. But even in the cities, another rebellion was brewing. In Zagreb, a man named Joseph Broz Tito was biding his time, gathering weapons, ammunition, and allies, waiting for the perfect moment to begin his uprising. Ever since the end of the First World War, Tito had led the Yugoslav Communist Party, which, despite its relatively popular support, had been illegal for many years. In fact, Tito had even served time in prison for simply being associated with the ideology, forcing him to take his operations underground. However, Tito saw this war as his ideal chance to bring it all back to the surface. In July 1941, two weeks after Germany began its invasion of the Soviet Union, Tito's communist rebels initiated their first attack on Axis troops in Serbia. The occupying forces now had two insurgencies to deal with. The Royalists, later called the Chetniks, and the Communists, later known as the Partisans. While both of these groups would continue to gain traction among the people of occupied Yugoslavia, it was Tito's partisan movement that really took off, attracting large numbers of people from all Yugoslav republics thanks to their inclusiveness. Tito saw everyone simply as a Yugoslav national, with their ethnicity coming second. The Chetniks, on the other hand, were a Serb-majority group, still hoping to restore the King of Serbia, and didn't take too well to other ethnicities joining their ranks. This would ultimately lead to them being eclipsed by their communist counterparts, whose influence uh, was now spreading like wildfire. The other thing that bolstered the communist movement was the absolute brutality with which the Axis treated Yugoslavia. The worst of this treatment took place in the Free State of Croatia, in which the ultranationalist Ustashi ruthlessly executed anyone who didn't love the idea of Croatian fascism. Under the Ustashi, as many as 700,000 Serbs, Jews, and Romani were murdered in cold blood in mass executions so brutal they pushed thousands more to flee and join the communist uprising. Things got even better for Tito when Germany 
Germany enacted a retribution policy. Sick of their soldiers being killed in partisan raids, they announced that for every dead German soldier, 100 Yugoslav civilians would be killed in reprisal. And this was no idle threat. In several instances, German soldiers hanged or shot these hundred, which could include men, women, children, and the elderly. This was meant to scare the insurgents away from fighting, but it actually achieved quite the opposite. Now, after a successful battle between the partisans and the Axis, entire towns were left with a decision. Wait for the German reinforcements to arrive and execute you in revenge, or pack your bags and join Tito's communists. As you can imagine, this was an easy choice, and soon villagers were joining the rebels en masse. By autumn 1941, the partisans had enough firepower to launch a large-scale operation and even teamed up with the Chetniks to liberate a sizable region in western Serbia, which they renamed the Republic of Vizice. This republic had the honor of being the first liberated territory in occupied Europe, but it would soon be retaken. Fascist propaganda convinced many of the Serbian locals that the partisans were the true enemies. And this, combined with the souring of relations with the Chetniks, turns the newly born republic into a full-blown civil war between the communists and the royalists, making Germany's job pretty easy when they showed up and kicked everybody out. By 1942, the partisans outnumbered the Chetniks, but perhaps because of their communist ideology, they weren't taken as seriously by the Allies, who viewed the royalist Chetniks as the leading resistance movement of Yugoslavia. However, despite being somewhat overshadowed by the Chetniks, Tito and his men still received a fair amount of supplies from the Allies, including both weapons and intel. The Chetniks also received these supplies, which was a bit of a mistake on the part of the Allies, as it would turn out that their allegiance wasn't so steady. By 1941, the leader of the largest Chetnik detachment, Mihailovic, was actually beginning to collaborate with the Axis. He believed that the best course of action was to appease the occupiers as much as possible to avoid more civilian deaths and wait for the Allies to arrive before continuing the fight. Tito, on the other hand, completely disagreed with this philosophy and began launching widespread guerrilla attacks against German and Italian positions, inflicting massive casualties, taking land, and of course, gaining more and more followers. Part of their success was not only their popularity with all ethnicities, but also their experienced leadership, a group of veterans who had volunteered to fight in the Spanish Civil War a few years earlier. These men were known as Yugoslav Brigadistas, and their experience in a wide range of combat situations would prove to be invaluable. The Yugoslav resistance had now morphed from an annoying pest to a serious fighting force, and something had to be done before it got out of hand. In particular, German high command was watching as their position in North Africa fell to the Allies, and with diminished control over the Mediterranean, an Allied landing in the Balkans was now a frightening possibility. Defending the region from an Allied landing and a local insurgency would be far too difficult, so the partisans needed to be eliminated as soon as possible. To this end, the Axis launched Case White in January 1943, their fourth anti-partisan operation of the war, a massive undertaking with more than 90,000 Axis troops from Germany, Italy, and Croatia, as well as thousands of collaborating Chetniks. The operation lasted from January until March, and despite managing to inflict heavy losses on the partisans, around 15,000 men, the Axis largely failed to achieve any of their strategic goals. Not to mention the partisans did manage to take out an estimated 9,000 Axis soldiers, which was quite impressive considering the odds they were up against. During the final battle of Case White, Tito barely managed to escape with his life. Surrounded on the banks of the Narepva River and under intense aerial bombardment, the partisans crafted an ingenious plan. They detonated charges on the river's bridges leading south, which was quickly noticed by German aircraft. When the Axis commanders were notified of this sabotage, they assumed it had been done to prevent the Chetniks from following the partisans as they fled north. To cut off their escape, an order was sent to redirect nearly all the German forces northward. But this was exactly what Tito had wanted. With the Germans running in the wrong direction, one of the bridges was quickly repaired and the communists made a daring crossing while fighting the Chetniks on the other side, just managing to escape before the Germans realized they'd been deceived. Case White was soon followed by Case Black, an even larger assault meant to crush the communist headquarters in southeastern Bosnia. This was perhaps the closest Tito himself came to being captured, as he just barely managed to escape a complete encirclement and flee northward with his men. Unfortunately, his escape meant breaking his promise of never leaving behind a wounded man, and 200,000 of them would be executed at the hands of the Germans, unable to flee the headquarters in time. These battles also marked the high point of Chetnik collaboration with the Axis powers, something that did not go unnoticed by the Allies. By this point, Western agents had been infiltrating the Yugoslav resistance, and direct collaboration with the enemy was the last straw. At the Tehran conference later that year, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union would unanimously declare their full support for Tito and the partisans. 
Throughout 1944, the Germans desperately tried to hunt down and eliminate Tito, but he managed to evade them every single time. Operation Night Sleep came close to capturing him, but ultimately failed, as did the Sixth Enemy Offensive, an operation aimed at recapturing the Croatian coastline after Italy had surrendered to the Allies. But by now, the partisans were much more than a deadly guerrilla force. They were so numerous, with as many as 800,000 men according to some sources, that they often engaged the Germans in open combat, especially when supported by Allied air support as the Americans and British inched closer every day. And while the partisans only grew, the Chetniks continued to shrink as thousands deserted or joined Tito's promising movement eager to be on the winning side of history. By late 1944, the clock was ticking on Axis control of Yugoslavia. The Soviet Union had successfully pushed the Germans westward in perhaps the bloodiest front line of all time, and by October the 14th, 1944, the Red Army was walking through the streets of Belgrade. By the time they arrived, they found the remaining Germans in Yugoslavia in complete disarray. Tito had launched a huge offensive in the eastern half of the country, liberating nearly all of the Western Balkans. And now, with the full backing of the Soviets, he marched onward, determined to dislodge the Axis from their final strongholds in Croatia and northern Bosnia. With their armies in shambles, outnumbered and outgunned, the remaining Germans turned and fled, leaving Tito to swoop in and not only capture the rest of Yugoslavia, but even advance into Italy, chasing after the retreating Axis troops. The last battle of World War II in Europe was fought between one of these retreating columns and Tito's men on the 14th of May 1945, actually taking place a whole week after Germany's unconditional surrender to the Allies. Europe had been liberated, and Tito's dream of a communist Yugoslavia had been realized. But this wasn't actually the end of the violence. Fascist collaborators knew that they faced no mercy in Yugoslavia, and so they fled to Austria, hoping to surrender to the Allies, who would at least imprison them. But the British army turned them back over to the partisans, who proceeded to execute all of them in revenge for their genocide against various minorities in Yugoslavia. In total, as many as 80,000 collaborators were killed, including the Chechnik leader Mihailovic, who was hunted down a year later and sentenced to death. This marked the true end of the royalist movement, who had lost most of its men in a desperate offensive near the war's end. Between these killings, the genocide carried out by the Ustashi, the ruthless treatment of civilians by the Axis, and the many battles, more than a million people died in Yugoslavia between 1941 and 1945, a significant portion of the population crippling the new nation, which would struggle to recover following the end of the war. Tito would ultimately found the People's Republic of Yugoslavia and would lead the nation for 35 years until his death in 1980. For all its issues, the nation managed to stay unified under his rule, still holding on to his original ideology of everyone being a Yugoslav first, with their unity as a nation superseding their ethnicity. But following his death, the nation struggled to stay afloat and would ultimately collapse in a brutal civil war in the 1990s, the country still rife with many of the issues that plagued it decades earlier. Despite Yugoslavia's unfortunate fate, Tito's legacy has been cemented as one of the greatest of the 20th century. It was largely thanks to his leadership and clever strategy that the partisans were widely regarded as the most effective resistance movement of the Second World War, with Yugoslavia becoming the only country in Europe to essentially liberate their own territory from the Axis occupation before the Allies arrived. Quite a remarkable feat, considering the rebellion's humble beginnings and the courage they must have possessed to stand up against their fascist occupiers.